Next up is Victor Ramirez. Victor is the lead product analytics engineer at The Knot Worldwide. Before The Knot, he was leading global WordPress projects at News Corp, specifically the Wall Street Journal. On the side, he runs an abstract agency, a WordPress-focused marketing agency, and co-organizes the WPNYC WordPress Meetup. To close things out, Victor is going to show us what's possible with the block editor, with examples that are beyond what you might otherwise expect. Let's welcome Victor. Hey, how's it going? This is Victor Ramirez, and welcome to Gutenberg Beyond the Block. Uh, as some of you may have heard today, uh, there's some really exciting stuff going on with what's going on the page in Gutenberg but I wanted to cover some other things and other potential opportunities that I've noticed uh, working in the WordPress space uh, and in the JavaScript space and the larger enterprise space that I currently work. First, I just do want to clarify, this is 100% uh, my personal and professional opinion. Uh, if for some reason uh, it blows up your cat or you recognize an idea uh, that uh, already exists, that's just chance. Uh, this is one for the lawyers. So, uh, Gutenberg. In 2018, uh, and you may have heard this in some of the other talks before, Gutenberg was scary, it was terrible, uh, and no one wanted it. And now in Gutenberg with 2020, people are curious, uh, they're in love with it, or they hate it. And I thought, think that most of the people who hate it, uh, they think of Gutenberg as a pretty terrible page builder. But I think before I get into anything else, we have to clarify that Gutenberg is not a page builder. Why is Gutenberg not a page builder? Well, it lacks theme compatibility. Usually when you are working with uh, a uh, page builder, it has some kind of themes that it works with uh, that it just rolls out. But Gutenberg uh, isn't, isn't built in that way. Um, it has no live editing. You don't actually edit on the front end. You're using the Gutenberg editor. It has limiting styling options. Uh, you can't go and build out these crazy landing pages with Gutenberg. It has limited scope. Uh, unlike where Elementor might have 100 different modules uh, built into it and allows background covers, video covers, and every single element, that's not what Gutenberg does out of the box. The page builder audience is more meant for DIYers, uh, small teams, limited budgets, and no custom application integrations. And when I show you what I mean by custom application integrations, um, that's where the real power in Gutenberg lies. But you may not need that with a page builder. So page builders are still okay. So just more than blocks, Gutenberg offers standards in line with the larger development community. And it's great that Gutenberg has backward, sorry, WordPress has backwards compatibility with a lot of older legacy projects. But to move forward in development, um, we need some of those newer kind of cool uh, standards that are going on in JavaScript uh, and the larger development community. So beyond the block, I'm going to talk about a simplified user experience, which you probably saw today, um, standardization of content and data and user interfaces, and examples to get you inspired. So um, I would argue that Gutenberg gives you the freedom to do more interesting things. And what do I mean by that? There's a simplified user experience. Before Gutenberg, you had the classic editor. Uh, and if anyone does any kind of user experience, there's something called cognitive overload. We have about 15 touch points here um, before 15, 20, 30 touch points before we even typed anything on the page. You had HTML. If you didn't want to use the visual, you know, tiny MCE visual editor, uh, you could use text mode, but that required someone to know HTML. You could use widgets. Um, which didn't really have any kind of uh, reference to how it would look on the front end. You know, in projects, I'm, you may have seen this, where you have a PDF reference of all the individual P, uh, widget sections on a theme. You had short codes. Uh, and short codes, if you knew how to put them in the right place, I, it's akin to learning a whole other form of HTML or markup language. Um, and then you have page builders. And while Elementor and Beaver Builder, which I like, this is actually from something called Fusion Page Builder, which I 
delightfully had to work with on a client project that I never heard of before. And I had to spend four hours learning how to mess around with and what it even looked like. Um, and then you had custom fields and custom fields gave developers that level of granular granularity that they might want the controls you can see this is a very limited interface but then you end up having a client who's like i want to be able to change things and do interesting things beyond what i was given in this uh, particular uh, very restricted custom fields so this is the classic workflow with gutenberg i want to create a cta you visit the dashboard you visit the ctas which is a custom post type in this assumption uh, you create and edit a cta you copy your short code uh, then after you copy your short code, um, you visit posts. In posts, you find the post you wanted the short code to, then you cut and paste the short code, and then fingers crossed, it looks like you expected. After Gutenberg, we have blocks. I go to the interface, um, I click the plus symbol, and I simply add the short code. Uh, now, of course, this UI or this modal pops up, and now we can use a modal to allow someone to add a short code. We can use, uh, in my previous slide, uh, a sidebar to allow controls of the short code. There's not many places of the person having to jump around. They can do it all inside that singular post without ever leaving the editor. So with the new workflow, uh, I want to create a CTA, add pop-up from Picker, fill in the fields, rock on. It's that easy. Um, and again, we kind of get in this, what I call milk bottle syndrome, uh, where people who work in WordPress, we think, well, it's just a short code. It's just so easy. Um, but is it really? Uh, because for people who don't know WordPress, um, if you're working on a one or two person website where one or two people are managing that, that totally works. Um, but if you're working on a website where you have hundreds of people um, and like a standard business, you have tons of churn um, and you don't know who's going to end up working on that website, you're talking about a lot of overhead to train those people. What else comes with Gutenberg? Um, standardized content, data, and user interfaces. Um, so what do I mean by that? Standardized content. Um, WordPress, and to some people's complaints, uh, the new editor stores all of the content in a serialized string. But that makes for easier parsing. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, it allows for ease of integration. Um, because we have one place to go and get the content. We're not going through a bunch of meta fields created by uh, custom fields. Uh, we're not going through you know different custom databases. Uh, it's, it's relatively stored in one place, or we could store it in external APIs. Um, no decisions, for better or for worse. Um, I always argue that people say, I can't be creative with these constraints, um, but every house has four walls and a roof, right? You would never call the Guggenheim boring. You would never complain that the Guggenheim, which is an art, for those who don't know, an art museum in New York City uh, is a boring architectural piece, but it still has fire alarms and it still has an egress in the case of an emergency. So what do I mean before Gutenberg with uh, content standards? There were many ways to go and add um, a button. We had div class equals button, short code something one equals something else. Um, you could simply add a button and then with even, without even adding a class, every single button gets styled a certain way. Um, and then you could use custom fields in your templates um, to get field my custom field. Um, and that's just a ACF example. Um, and there's many different ways to get the content in there. But now with Gutenberg, uh, there's a standardized markup. Uh, and, you know, love or hate it. Uh, it is a standard and having one way to look at the content and to parse through that content, it's much easier to write a script that can just crawl through this. Um, by having standardized content, it also means that we have a data standard via the data module. Um, so via the data module, WP data, and if you're in your Gutenberg, Gutenberg editor, um, if you're interested and you're not a developer, uh, just right click inspect go to the console and type in wp.data um, and you get access to everything that exists in the um, Gutenberg uh, state. So uh, for example, you could do wp.data.select core editor get blocks and that will return all the blocks that are on that page. Um, and so by doing that, you can do some really interesting things which, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, other things, UI standards. Uh, we now have standards of 
blocks uh, instead of and again like it's not to critique how things were done uh, you know a lot of the times I was uh, there was a talk earlier by the guy who did atomic blocks um, and he said that developers would just go and build a plugin and get it out there with not much thought to how a user might use it and you know ugly dashboards different user experiences and back to what I spoke about before the cognitive overload you're asking a uh, user to go and relearn every single time they use the application. Imagine if you were driving a car and the steering wheel moved every single time you got in that car. That's what it feels like when you go from third-party plug-in to third-party plug-in. And if you don't drive, imagine if the door to your house moved and you had to walk around your house every single time to figure out how to get inside the house. It is infuriating, it's exhausting. Now, as a developer, those decisions are taken away from you. And you might be thinking, those decisions got taken away from you, and that's a problem. Um, but let's not think of it like that. Think of them as tools, components, and patterns. You don't go and design your own hammer. You use the hammer to build a house or the Guggenheim. So what are some examples of these in the wild? Um, what are some examples of thinking beyond the block and thinking beyond having to come up with design patterns? Where does my button go? What should my interface be? Why don't we start to think about what exciting things can I do in WordPress that I couldn't do before? So design is solved, right? Let's focus on the bigger problems. Here's a couple that I've worked with. Um, one of my favorite examples is similar to the custom post type thing that I showed before. Um, a lot of the times clients want to bring in their custom post types. This is an example. One of my favorite things now is to use um, advanced custom fields to create FAQ uh, or testimonial uh, testimonials and a custom post type that allow data entry um, via spreadsheets or another tool um, or some kind of CRM integration. Uh, and then the user can simply just go and grab their testimonials and place them on the page. They don't have to go over and find a testimonial paste short code. What else? Um, we can parse all the block quotes every single time that a post is published. So when someone, and you could trigger it on any hook, when someone publishes a post, uh, grab all the block quotes, grab the quote text, grab the URL, attach your UTM parameters, those are for marketing and attribution, um, and add them to a spreadsheet. And if you use something like Buffer or Hootsuite, those are auto-scheduled. Um, and think about that. If you have 10 quotes in an article, all of a sudden you don't need to hire a social media manager. You just can go and make this. Uh, and this is an example showing you like what it's scheduling. You can go and schedule this like a tweet creator and these things and you can even images, you can grab your featured image and place your featured image as the first images um, on that you know particular Twitter card. Another great example, uh, I couldn't find a screenshot of it, uh, Bill Erickson presented earlier today, um, and he created a table of contents via headings. And the way he was able to do that was to parse through all of the blocks, find every uh, H2, H3, um, and then line them up uh, as a table of contents at the top of a post. And that's via a block. And if you haven't seen that before, that is similar to Google Docs automatically does outlines now for their documents. Um, so one of the big things I recommend is not looking inside the WordPress space of what's interesting, look outside of WordPress. What's interesting outside of WordPress that you could bring into WordPress? And I think the Google Docs table of contents that's auto-generated via headings is pretty cool. Um, the autocompleter API, I've actually done this a few times now, um, where there is an API in uh, WordPress, uh, in Gutenberg, that allows you to create your own autocompleter. You can go and try it um, doing A, uh, the, you know, the uh, at symbol in uh, the Gutenberg editor, um, but you can also disable that uh, autocompleter and you can add your own autocompleter or your own autocompleter library. That would be great for authors, great for tagging people on Twitter, uh, great for grabbing images, uh, great for autocompletion of text. Um, you can do conditional catching because now that you know, you can fire in any hook or any particular state um, in the post and you could capture words that aren't allowed. You could make it that they can't hit publish if they don't meet a certain character count. Again, back to WP data, you can go into WP data um, and grab uh, a character count. Uh, you can get an image count. You could say if there are not five image blocks, block the ability uh, to publish this post. Uh, if the images aren't certain uh, sizes, if the images don't have the right keywords, all of that data is right there um, on the page and you could parse that and you can do restrictions. Uh, so for example, on a project I'm working on right now, we have a problem. People aren't entering their UTM parameters. So we are auto adding UTM parameters to any links that uh, um, go to another site or even with affiliate links, we're auto attaching affiliate links. Um, 
Another example, um, one of the big things when you're using APIs, this is an example I saw in the wild where someone used the Canvas JS library to make uh, doodles. Uh, but we had a project recently uh, where we were doing charts and we don't want to do an API call every time someone's doing a chart with particular data from a particular project. Uh, and we also, what if that API goes away? What if that API disappears? So what we did was uh, we made a block uh, where the whenever the person was building the chart, they were referencing the API. Um, but then when the post was published or the block was saved, uh, it would save the block as a flattened image or a flattened SVG. Um, and therefore, the API calls, once it was published, it was no longer making API calls. The API calls to the costly uh, chart or data API was only made um, when the user was trying to manipulate the block, which is a lot less than the millions of times the post is read. Um, and then finally, one of my favorite examples now um, is that you don't need the media library anymore. Uh, if anyone has tried to use the WordPress media library before um, or modify it anyway, it is it was at one time okay documented. I had to recently work on it with a project and there is the WordPress Media Explorer plugin um, from Automatic, which I forked and you know, used for a project. And it was okay. Um, it is a PHP wrapper for a JavaScript backbone library, um, which there's not a lot of great documentation on Backbone anymore. You don't even have to worry about that. For most of my projects where we're using custom images or using an external media library, um, we are just bringing in a modal window, doing a reference to an API, and serving our images um, via the standard image block and inserting our uh, image URLs. And that was impossible before um, because we weren't using um, things like React thing, you know, um, and JavaScript libraries you can easily bring in. Um, but with Gutenberg, that's all possible. Um, so this takes care of a lot of the hurdles um, that you may have had before. So my challenge to people is not just think about the block, but think about what integrations can you do? Can you make a CRM block? Can you make a block that allows for people to build custom pages when they visit it? Do they see their user profile and is it via a block? And again, I'm not saying that the user that visits your website is gonna use Gutenberg, but can I as a marketer create custom pages and widgets um, so that when someone visits particular pages, they get a totally custom user experience because I can manipulate the data on that page using the standard Gutenberg block builder because my development team can now go and edit uh, anything they want on that page via simple REST APIs or GraphQL. Um, Thank you for your 15 minutes of time. Uh, and now, uh, again, this is pre-recorded, so hopefully, fingers crossed, I have five minutes of time left for some Q&A. Thank you. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the Q&A session. I'm here with Victor Ramirez. We're going to go through some of the questions that have been asked uh, regarding his talk and see how that plays out. Victor, how are you doing right now? Good, man. Uh, just quarantined like everyone else. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Uh, let's see. First question up. You mentioned that it's easier to write scripts to parse the content now that we have standardized markup via Gutenberg. What kind of scripts are you talking about? Could you share a specific example? Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, before, um, if you had uh, an article um, that was written with the tiny MCE and maybe it had some custom fields. Um, and so you would before have to um, write a, well, in PHP, you would have to parse through uh, first wherever that content is stored. Um, and then you would also then have to go into where the metadata is stored uh, and get all the data for those articles. Or you would have to go and manually do, you know, get all the fields um, in, in like a PHP template. Um, but that wasn't so easy for things like in the REST API, um, whereas in the, you know, the new Gutenberg markup, it's all just stored in one field or one cell, the content. Um, and if you can just grab that um, and then you can parse through it. And again, because there's like a standardized markup, uh, you don't have to kind of like figure weird things out. If people are putting short codes in, if they're writing their own custom HTML or any kind of, you know, any weird things, you can, you can just use standardized markup. Really cool. Okay. And uh, David asks, what's something you'd like to see outside the block for extension? Is there something you've tried but you couldn't do? That you couldn't do? Yeah, we were kind of riffing on that when I first got in the green room. Um, just because with everything going on with uh, the current COVID-19 situation, um, 
one of the things I've noticed is that just like restaurateurs and small businesses are terrible at maintaining their hours, you know, having updates, letting people know what's going on. Like, Hey guys, we now have takeout, right? They don't, they never gathered email lists. Um, but one of the things I was talking to someone about was Google does this interesting thing where it sends you an email and says, are you open today? And then you click the button and it automatically says you're open, right? Or it says, Hey, what are your hours? And they're doing this kind of automation. Um, but that's only Google. It doesn't cover Yelp. It doesn't cover any of these other tools. Um, and so, what, you know, what I'd like to see are things like that, where a restaurant tour um, can be just, you know, log into WordPress. He's driven right to like a footer section where there's his hours. He enters it, and then having that send to additional APIs, like so Yext. I don't know if they have an, you know, an API that sends to Yelp and then sends to Google and all these places. And so the restaurant tour, you know, that way, if any of these, you know, startups pop or close they still have their website and then they can just add other connections. So, so stuff like that, where it makes it easier to like, you know, be able to edit it easily, but then send that data wherever, almost like a distribution system. That's what I'm into. That, that's the kind of stuff I haven't done yet. That's really interesting too. Yeah. I could see how that could help, especially in this, like the situation that we're all in right now. Yeah. So Birgit asks, couldn't it, could an integration with Google sheets or Airtable be generalized? Um, I'm not sure about Airtable, but actually in my, in my current work, um, most of the scripting that I do is in Google Sheets, and Google Sheets is a standard REST API. Um, so, so a lot of developers, um, and, uh, and I guess the ones that I've worked with, they'll sometimes use Google Sheets as a temporary database for like a mock create, you know, React application. Um, but so um, using Google Sheets, you can you, you can integrate to like do social. Um, I do it where now I will go and see get like a list of authors, uh, you know, on the WordPress website. Uh, I will go into like Confluence and see if people didn't update their database. So, you know, um, sorry, update their um, uh, their readmes. That's like a big thing I'm trying to push at where I work. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine where you don't want people to have to go into WordPress to go and see if like, you know, what are our SEO scores? What are, you know, sometimes the WordPress interface isn't perfect in a mobile phone. Um, whereas if you could send that data and that's how easy Google Sheets is, it's just a basic database um, via the REST API. And you could standardize that. Um, and I guess that would be more like if someone built a visual builder of it, um, but you can use it to like, you know, send tweets, you could send a report of like all SEO optimized article articles. Um, and that's all via um, JSON and REST. So yeah, it's already kind of standardized via the Google app script system. Hmm. This reminds me a little bit of, uh, I'm just riffing off that a little bit, like Zapier or, or uh, if this, then that sort of system can be integrated with uh, Gutenberg in a way as far as building sites or blocks being used or content within block and kind of like what that might spur for. Right. And there's not, yeah. And there's not even um, to say, you know, you could do that if you knew where to hook it in Gutenberg, right? Because Zapier runs by actions um, and some Zapier integrations aren't great. Google groups has one. It says when a message is received. When you use something like an active campaign as a hundred actions, like when an email is sent, when this is clicked, when that is done. So if you could match to when a block, maybe that's too granular when a block is moved, but when the CTA is updated on Gutenberg, then go and up the CTA somewhere else or go and update my Google ad. So for example, you could have it where like you could match your Google ad um, to the CTA that you have on the particular landing page. Um, so that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Got another question here. Victor Andrea asks, are there more examples of things that are interesting outside of WordPress that you would like to be able to do in or with WordPress? In or with WordPress? The other one or? So I guess like, I guess for me, it's like, I, there's so many things that are outside WordPress that um, we haven't really done yet. So for example, um, one of the things I've noticed is a lot of it, like, and this, I love advanced custom fields. Um, it's a great tool, but the one thing that I don't like about using Gutenberg, uh, sorry, using ACF to create Gutenberg blocks is you're essentially just creating a field flipper. It's a, it, you get fields and you flip it to whatever it represents, right? Whereas with Gutenberg, you can actually get fully custom UIs. People, you know, they keep limiting themselves by using Gutenberg as a field builder. Um, the things that I find really exciting is, you know, we did an autocompleter um, recently for a byline at my previous role at, at News Corp. Um, and, you know, some people made autocompleters where you drag and drop the name for the author and you would add that. I said, 
why are we doing that? In Asana, in Facebook, and Twitter, you use the at symbol and you pull in the author's API. Why are we using the, so what I'm really interested in seeing is almost everything now that we have again react and like you know this nice you know javascript playground um we can borrow anything so we could say like hey i love the way that asana does trello cards maybe i could make a trello cards like a trello card type block that brings in my work progress so i'm a freelancer and now i have a trello block or like a you know a kanban block right and in that kanban block i can pull in like my asana api or i could pull in like a Google Sheet I'm using to track a project. And I just go in there and move it over. And then now I have a really cool block that I can like, you know, I can send that link to clients so they can see where the project is. But I, as like a freelancer, can like, I don't have to give them a sauna access. Because if you ever give a client a sauna access and they can build, they go crazy, right? And so you just <laughs> want to have it hosted on a website. So you could do really interesting intranets to kind of have like WordPress be the publishing house of every crazy interface out there. Um, because that's the other thing too. Clients haven't, or not even like me, like having to go from like a Google product to a segment to another product to another company. The interface is all over the place. Whereas having like a singular place to view everything in your own visualized standard, it makes it a lot easier to kind of like not go blind from all the numbers you're looking at all day. How interesting. Um, I don't know if you caught the talk by Greg and and Miguel earlier today. But there was something very similar that it, that your conversation here kind of spurred in my memory is that they had an, a way that had a block that kind of indicated a progress bar. And as tasks, it was like a project management block, as tasks were being checked off, this progress bar and this block would fill up to 100%. And that kind of reminded me of as if that was integrated or something with a project board and GitHub or something, you know, as things got moved to done. You know, yeah, work and a two-way sync would be amazing. It'd be amazing that if you in Gutenberg could go and be like, "Hey, I'm in this, you know, particular thing, and I'm gonna move the card over," and it all, you know, it fired over, and you can use that. With, you know, um, I'm pretty sure Atlassian has a, you know, has JQL or their REST API, and you could do that. Um, <laughs> and so, so it makes it where you know the publishers and teams can like work in multiple places. Um, but yeah, that, that I guess that's the most exciting stuff for me is like you know taking stuff from the outside and bringing it in and being able to create a single user experience. I really like that you, you're talking, you know, be, beyond the block in Gutenberg um, is really promising to see what sort of future it, it has for just everybody and everything being involved with WordPress and kind of how we can carry it further and become more than just uh, a CMS possibly. Maybe it could really link in with other pieces throughout the internet and become that web operating system in a sense. Yeah, yeah, I try to tell. I'm working with a company right now. Sorry, a large art gallery in my freelance work. Um, that they lost ninety percent of their business, um, and that's kind of why I was uh, in January. I was aware of COVID nineteen because I had a um, client that lost ninety percent of their business in Shanghai and in Beijing. And um, what we've kind of told them is like, now your website um, is your um, it's your business cockpit. It, it can manage your email list. It can manage your you know, we cre we're creating custom viewing rooms that are mobile friendly, um, that allow them to like go through like a virtual showroom for art um, to, to make sales online, which they never did before. But we were able to do that very easily because WordPress was a very simple interface for them to understand. And the one person, you know, I always say throw a rock in Brooklyn, you'll find someone who's used WordPress. And of course, some a, a, a young a woman who was their um, art gallery manager said, oh, I know WordPress, yeah, throw me in. And now she's working wow. with us to, you know, build their business cockpit for this new world that we're in. That's so cool. I just read an article about that, how how like museums are really taking oh, yeah. the online experience farther now because there are so many businesses have to close their doors right now. Yep. Victor, thank you so much. That's all the questions I have for you today. But um, I really appreciate you coming on the event, the WP Block Talk, and sharing with us your wisdom and your experience with Gutenberg. It was a joy to watch. Cool, and I know it wasn't as exciting like with the the design before the one I came in on. I was like, oh, I'm following up this like this amazing like fireworks show, and I'm gonna I'm here like coming in just talking about APIs and data. I'm like, all right. <laughs> no, no, no. There is definitely crowds for APIs and data. It's okay. It's okay. Great. Cool. Victor, you take care. All right. Thanks so much, man. Thank you.